uh, a privilege to welcome stage uh, to welcome on stage mr sunil subramaniam managing director sundaram mutual he has over 3 decades of experience in the financial services sector we are sure to benefit from his insights in a very interestingly titled presentation the silk route the chinese link in india's low to global dominance okay over to you sir the stage is yours The mic is on. Good evening. Thank God he didn't ask me to do the lungi dance. <laughs> But uh, you know, Kamfa always comes up with very interesting uh, titles for their conference. So when they changed to MF Dash or whatever, I thought, will they retain that same church spa? You know. I remember they had a four C's once, and then they had 2.0 Indian economy 2.0. So this was a very interesting topic, and they said India's road to global dominance. So I thought, why not I myself take a very different outlook, and I'm going to talk very less about India, right? And that's why you saw the title, right? Because I believe that India's path to global dominance is fairly clear, but that path lies. on plagiarism many people say it's bad to copy right that may be true in an exam hall but in life right copying helps you to learn from others mistakes and not repeat those copying helps you to see the trodden path and go along that and i believe for us china is clearly that entity as a country which has seen both good and bad and to follow their good and make sure that we don't repeat their bad i think is an excellent route for our country to follow in this process so i thought i'll spend a, some time in looking at china of course we'll compare india to china to see where the opportunities are so right so the chinese link what do i mean by that so this is a picture of the world in 2006 by gdp size and if you look at here this is the ranking the first column the us was number 1 japan was second germany was third china was already fourth then because this journey started in 2003 i couldn't locate a 2003 chart by 2006 china was fourth india was 14th okay and come to the present day china is already second from fourth and by 2031 it's slated to take over from america as the number one ranked gdp country in the world right so that for us then what does it imply but first of all look at the scale of the chinese growth china's gdp today is four times that of its next two competitors which were number 2 and 3 in 2006 so the if you can truly say dre that china has made the world a bipolar world that's the us and china if you add their two gdps together it's 10 times of germany's or japan's gdp so that's the kind of dream that india needs to have if we are to be globally dominant you can't be just another japan or germany hovering around so the ranking doesn't matter the size matters right and what this has done for them as i mentioned it started in 2003 is that the real gdp if you index it has gone up four and a half times and their nominal gdp has gone up seven times right and the fact of the matter is that their per capita gdp has gone up six times from 2100 dollars to 12000 dollars right so india is to become dominant these are the aspirations we must set for ourselves and how did this happen like i said it's their journey that i'm going to want us to copy so if you see the growth it's their sustained double digit growth period happened here somewhere between 2002 and 3 to 2008 and what was the trigger that golden period of double digit gdp growth came because 
2008 Beijing Olympics. They won the Olympics obviously many years back, but from 2003, they started focusing on building the infrastructure to make the Olympics a success. And in that journey, it was not just for the Olympics. I don't know what's going to happen to Qatar after the World Cup, whether those stadiums are going to be used. But China made sure that the airports, the ports, the roads, the highways, all of them went up to speed to enable them to do what? To enable them to become the manufacturing capital of the world. So the first question and answer here is the road to global dominance is through infrastructure development. Right? That's what China did. The other two double-digit GDP growth we can ignore because they came just after the GFC and the COVID crisis on a YOY basis because the base was low. Right? So now then, let's look at India versus China. India is way, way, way behind China. Right? We are today at a per packet of GDP that they were in 2006. We are less than half of them in urbanization. We are one sixth, one seventh of them in terms of passenger car sales. So in consumption metrics, we are way behind them. Right? So can India really replicate the China story? The answer to that is yes. Why do I believe it? Because China itself. So I come to the second part now. First is to copy the root of China, which was infrastructure. The second is China itself is presenting us an opportunity on a plate. It's up to us to grab that. How? Because one mistake that China did was in 2002, if you see, this is their labor supply growth path. 2002, their growth was, labor supply was growing rapidly. So with that population at their control, they could pitch for outsourcing of the entire world to their country. They could get MNCs to come to their country. But some Mao Zedong type of character said that this population is a burden and put down the one family, one child rule and artificially they penalize people for having the third child. Right? And what they have succeeded in achieving is, from 2017, their labor population has started declining. So what is the cause of their success? Like an elephant throwing mud on itself, they have themselves caused the failure. So what is happening because of this? If you see, their 6x per capita income growth meant what? That not only is the labor supply decreasing, the cost of labor has gone from $2,000 to $9,800 per worker. So the first bad news for China is that the number of people able to work are coming down. The second is the cost of labor is shooting up. The third disaster was man-made. When COVID started in a lab and was deliberately released or by accidentally released, the fact is that COVID was a disaster as far as China is concerned because first of all, it caused a supply shock. So many MNCs, so many countries were dependent on Chinese supply for their products. And when China shut down the lockdown, they ran out of products to sell. The second was the credibility erosion which China suffered because of that. As a result of which, global MNC started exploring an alternative to China, which is what is called the China plus one movement. And if you see, intention to move out of China dramatically changed when COVID happened. So 44% of people polled who were MNCs said it increases their intention to move out of China. The production that they quantitatively also wanted to shift change from a small account to a moderate and a large amount and for new capacity also they wanted to create they said i will not choose china i will go outside so this movement right is how will this china plus one now play out right if we are to take advantage of that the answer to that lies in first what's the size of the opportunity so this is just china's export-import balance with the US, only one country. 
right? So 2015, 2019, 2020, as you can see, all of this anti-China movement and everything hasn't made a difference to how much they are exporting. Their exports, in fact, 480 dropped during COVID to 450, is back on track to 500. So just to the US, there's $500 billion of exports with the potential to shift out. And that shift, right? As things stand today, if you take an average of 450 billion at available, Vietnam is in the pole position to grab 140 million. That's 30%. India is a distant second. What is the reason for this? Because when you then now look at India, I have now added India to this chart. You can see that we are so way behind China that for us today, we have only $73 billion of exports to US. There's $500 billion there. So the opportunity for India is huge. And the basis on which stuff moves from one country to another is all of these advantages. But as you saw, Vietnam grabbed it because if you see the yellow line here, Vietnam got that on the basis of their lower labor costs and to some extent the labor expertise. So this is where we will evaluate India's advantages. And here comes the truth. While China, the red line, started losing their working age population, India, we have no idea about family planning or population control. So for us, for the next 30 years, till the year 2050, our working age population is stated to steadily rise and rise and rise. So first thing is that we can be there as an opportunity because a company can plan for 30 years setting up a factory in India and not worry about labor shortage. So this is the big structural advantage that India possesses. The second aspect of it is so in quantity terms, this is mind-boggling. Because from 2017, when China started losing people, working age, the decade after, they are losing 21 million people from their workforce. India, in that same period, is going to have 116 million people. Six times as much as China is losing. And six times as much as the next country available to us. So it's a huge advantage for India. And we are going to be adding around 22% of the world's working age population in our country. Just one country. Right. And this will give you in stark that just no competition when it comes to a labor-oriented project. Right? So from that point of view, now when you look at it, what is at stake? One is in terms of the size of the US pie that I showed you. The second is, look at this, the yellow dots are the share of that country's working age population and the blue bar are that share of the world's exports of that country. You can see that China has got a greater share of the world exports than its share of the population. Whereas for India, this is a share of the population, this is a share of the exports. Right? So the second question here is labor-oriented export is the root. The so first is infrastructure, second is labor-oriented exports, right? Now, let's look at the other aspect, labor cost. This was labor supply. So India's per capita GDP, as I said, is where China was then. But if you look at now the labor cost per person in dollars, China is 9,800, India is 3,800. We are 60% cheaper than China in labor costs. Now you say, why is this so high? Because China's was 2000 when their per capita was 2000. Their per capita was 12, it's close to it. Because in India, half of our population doesn't work. That's the women of India, right? A lot of them work at home, but that's not counted in the GDP, they are not manufacturing. Whereas in China, everybody goes to work. That's why, if you see for India, it's almost 80% higher our per capita wages compared to our per capita income. Okay, but we are still 60% cheaper. So not only does India have a labor supply advantage, we have a labor cost advantage. The third thing is that in the world from a manufacturing wage, we are among the cheapest in the world from a manufacturing perspective. China is somewhere here, this is the other countries. So 
And from a skill perspective, thanks to the British education system, thanks to the engineering colleges and the chartered accountancies, everything, from a skilled, basic, medium, advanced skill perspective, India stands way above the rest of the world, right? So labor is a key part of our story to global dominance. And productivity-wise, we are behind China still. Our labor productivity is at 4.8. China is at 8.2. But we have made rapid progress from 2001 to now. But we need to sustain this because the higher value added work is what India needs to get. Right? And so now when you come back to this chart, we talked about the labor and the labor expertise. But there are two other key factors. For an MNC to choose India over China or over Vietnam or over Philippines. That's size of domestic market and tax rates, which is where the government has acted. So from now on, I'm going to talk about this opportunity, how is the government beginning to capsulate it? So first is the tax rate cuts. We were at 30% pre-surcharge. We dropped it to existing companies to 22 and for new manufacturing to 15, which is the best tax rate in the world. So our government, I think, has done a fabulous job in making sure that tax is not a hindrance for a foreigner to come in. The second aspect is the, when a foreigner comes in, he is not worried only about exporting. He would like to sell off his product to the domestic population. That's where I showed you there that size of the domestic market is a key driver. So for us, we have just overtaken China in terms of the size of the middle class. So a huge domestic market exists for an MNC to venture into India, right? Now comes to the other aspect. A lot of these advantages have been there for some time, but still foreigners haven't been walking up to the door and wanting to invest in India because of our poor quality infrastructure. And so I think the government has started work on that front we have the NIP pipeline of 111 lakh crores. We have the focus of that on roads, railways, drinking water, sanitation, power, which are the critical infrastructure areas. We have them expect to take a 40 to 50 percent hike in infrastructure spend as a percentage of GDP, right? And this year, for the first half budget estimate, the real estimate things, numbers that came out, I'm happy to say that against the targeted 25% growth in capex, they've actually achieved a 50% growth in capex. So I believe the government has got its right hat on and is doing the right things as far as infrastructure is concerned. Right? The second thing is a plan to finance that infrastructure. We get loans from Korea XM and Japan XM and everybody else, but monetizing their assets, a journey they've started, is also a key showing that their heart is in the right place. And this capital expenditure is self-succeeding, right? It itself will give a huge boost to our GDP because there's a persistence to capex as opposed to revenue expenditure like Narega or salaries or farm loan waivers and the like. So I think that's where our GDP will get a boost. So today, thanks to these efforts, if you look at the financial attractiveness thanks to taxation, you look at the people skill and availability, and you put in business environment, which though is very small, we are already reasonably very attractive compared to the rest of the countries, right? So now comes the fact that when US CFOs were surveyed, right, obviously they choose a wide range of countries compared to that, but India features fairly high in terms of with Japan and Hong Kong as a destination of choice. And if you take an MNC sentiment index, right, that if you see for China has been dropping and India has been rising. And surprise, surprise, Chinese CFOs themselves, though not very high priority, have picked India as one of the destinations where they want to get out of their own labor costs and supply issues and move production out. So even despite Galwan and despite all that, they, some of them have looked at India as a destination. So now we come to the other big step the government has done, which is the PLI scheme. I would like to call the PLI as more of a bribe. It's an incentive. They are giving 5% for a new manufacturer in specified sectors for five years cash back. Right? 
Why? Because we are trying to replicate the China export success story through PLI. What are we doing? The same thing, because there's a huge gap between our labor supply and exports, and hence they have chosen labor-oriented sectors where China has been very strong to give this incentive. And the beauty of this is that not only will this in the medium term, if it succeeds, add to our export share of the world, but in the next three to four years, as these facilities get built up, it will give a huge capital expenditure boost to our economy and the GDP. So PLI will have a double whammy, first a GDP boost through CapEx and later a GDP boost through exports. Right? So these are the things, roughly the kind of capital outlay expected. Right? And if you see, unlike Make in India in its original avatar, PLI has begun to succeed. So many MNCs have already set up shop, so many are planning to set it up, and Apple and Samsung and uh, Google have made major decisions to shift production out of China into India. So PLI is on a success journey which we need to sustain. Right? Now, where are the growth rates being seen? Right? Sectors like chemicals, where you see India's growth rate is far higher than the rest of the world. In automotive parts, you see again India's growth rates are very, very high compared to the rest of the world. Right? The other aspect of the PLI is that it's a self-financing initiative because when government spends on infrastructure, they need to go and source money either from domestic through borrowings or through public sector doing equity issues or through foreigners. But the PLI, because it's largely to MNCs, will come with FDI. And for a capital-starved nation like us, that's like mana from heaven. So if you see that, we have been keeping pace with China. The black line is India, the red line is China in terms of attracting FDI flows. And unlike FII flows, which are volatile and outflows and inflows, FDI has been consistently growing. In fact, if you look at this number, right from 2001, in the early part of the decade, we used to get something like four to five low single digit numbers as FDI flows annually. Today, we are getting 70 to 80 billion dollars of FDI flows. Not all of it is PLI. A lot of it comes as private equity into Baiju's and the companies like that. That's why if you see, as a share of the world FDI, India is getting close to 3% of the world. Last year, we saw a spike because of the private equity interest in Indian software, Indian fintech and edtech and all those type of companies. But otherwise, a consistent 2.5 to 3% of world FDI share is coming to India. Right? So it's a self-financing thing from BLI. The other driver on the back of this is going to be private capex. A sad story for the last decade, but because capacity utilization has now come past 75-76% above our long-term average, you are seeing that a BSE 500 capex, which was hardly 1% over the last decade, now suddenly, because they are sitting on $10.5 trillion of cash, because they didn't spend it on capex, the second is that they have used this cash to reduce their borrowings, corporate debt to GDP has come down, and they are today getting a return on invested capital of 10 to 11 percent. Why I'm pointing this out? For an Indian private manufacturing entrepreneur, his business is making 10 to 11 percent, he's going and putting it in liquid funds with mutual funds and getting 4 to 5 percent. So his willingness to invest in capex along with the ability, both are now very strong, and on the ground, you are seeing that private capex announcements have started shooting up. You have a lot of industries, chemicals, renewable energy, which are leading the path and in pharma. And projects under implementation, both on government and private, have generally been going, though last month was a drop. And new project implementations also have been going. So the private sector capex is also going to be a big story for the next decade. Right? So from that point of view, if you see the number of announcements which have recently happened in oil and gas, autos, cement, roadways, manufacturing, consumer, in terms of capex announcements, it augurs very well for the capex cycle. So as a result of which, the fourth leg to the capex story is the housing story. Because today housing affordability, despite the rise in interest rates by what, 100 to 200 basis points on the home loans, is still Property prices divided by annual income is still at a two and a half decade low. So it was never easier or cheaper to buy a house. In fact, given that rentals have gone up, it now makes sense to buy second houses and third houses and fourth houses with a kind of 
benefits that are there. And hence, new property sales have now highest in eight years. You've had an absorption rate, that means unsold inventory getting used up at an increasing place. And if you take Delhi, Bombay, and Bangalore, the three-city residential property price index itself tells you about the demand supply conundrum. Right? Hence, as a combination of these factors, we think that CapEx as a percentage of GDP should go from the 27% to 36% of GDP by end of the decade. Right? And our manufacturing as an output would go three times from 400 billion to 1200, maybe even to four times if everything falls into place. Right? And so we expect that manufacturing share of our GDP should shoot up from 15% of GDP to 20% by the end of decade. But that manufacturing will lead to its automatic discretionary consumption cycle because the rise in per capita income is followed by a rise in discretionary expenditure. And $2,000 is a kind of flexion point in number of countries after which for the next decade, two decades, per capita shoots up and discretionary shoots up. I've taken an example of China with their car penetration and South Korea with their car penetration. You can see the kind of phenomenal rises in the per capita income were accompanied by rises in discretionary consumption. And the reason for this is basically that, first of all, from India's perspective, while China went from 2000 to 12,000, we shouldn't live in dreamland. We should be more realistic that we are not a dictatorial government. We can't just push through. You saw the formulas had to be rolled back. You saw the kind of opposition came to Agnivir as a spring. So from that point of view, if you are more realistic and say we will roughly double our per capita income, then the impact of that, I'm sure somebody else would have shown you similar slides, but the point I want to make is that when in 2010 we were $1,000 and today we are 2000 when it doubled, can you see the income mix of the population, how dramatically it changed, right? So your poorest of the poor, which is your strugglers, went from 33% to 22% of the population and your middle class or lower middle class remained the same but all of the rest went upstairs. So the next doubling of per capita income should see that you'll have half of the population come from the super rich, the rich, and the upper middle class. That buying power is what is going to drive the discretionary consumption story. And if you take $35,000 as a benchmark, you'll see that there's going to be from 5.6 house million households to 25 million households. So a 5x growth in a $35,000 plus income bracket will be a phenomenal driver because a poor man, right? Sorry, I, I went back instead of forward. A poor man spends half of his income on food, tobacco, beverages, and the like. But as the income goes up, he shifts his expenditure to what is called as discretionary. Why discretionary? Only when he has the money, he has a choice to buy or not to buy. That's discretion, whereas the top line is called consumer staples. So this shift up, you can see that how just food goes from 47 to 14 as a man gets into the super rich stage. This is what is going to drive the consumption story, right? And so if you see our consumption story, there's a huge amount of drivers, part of which I have mentioned, part of which are there here because there are social economic factors like nuclearization here, urbanization. All of these are going to be a phenomenal driver to the consumption story. And hence, combined with our largest middle class slide, which you already saw, we believe that investment and consumption engines put together are going to be the key drivers of our GDP growth. And the banking sector is going to benefit from the support. Why? Because in this period, when you went from 1,000 to 2,000, when our per capita income doubled, banking penetration as term deposits, current account and savings account tripled. So the banking system, see when a person gets more income, not only does he spend on higher good quality goods, he cannot also eat more than half a kilo of biryani. He can't buy more than 25 houses. <laughs> There's a limit to everything and that surplus spills over into savings, which the banking system has hitherto been beneficiary to. Hopefully the mutual fund industry will be a greater beneficiary of that in the coming decade. But this banking system is flush with money. And if you look at India's credit to private sector, we are at 52% of GDP, whereas China is at 160%. Right? So the scope for credit to grow and in itself boost the GDP because both investment and this need bank finance. 
and credit growth has already started picking up. You can see the V-shaped curve there, right? And in the last five years, you already saw a 15% CAGR of housing, consumer durable loan, and empty credit cards. So the next decade, I think a similar kind of a growth you can expect. So overall credit to GDP itself by the end of the decade, we think will hit 100% of our GDP. Some of you here might not welcome it, saying is India getting into a debt trap, but that's a socio-economic aspect. But a pure hard thing is this is inevitable because of the buy now, pay later kind of a syndrome, right? So as a result, these three, manufacturing, consumption and services, I think would contribute at least a 12% CAGR for the next 15 years for the Indian economy. And hence, from an India versus China, India is now beginning to catch up. How is that? First of all, what you see here is that what they did from 2007 to 11, we think we'll do in 10 years, right? What they achieved in four years, we think we'll do it in 10 years, one. Two is that whether it's nominal GDP or per capita, the same story, but where are we catching up with the Chinese very fast internet population? Our penetration is almost as good as the China. In renewable energy, we are as good there. And in fact, if you see on consumption growth, India's growth rate of consumption has been higher YOY over the last five years than China. And if you look at the way the world has reacted to COVID and its aftermath, and this is IMF's continuous re-rating of the world growth, you can see that China's growth has been continuously re-rated down Whereas India's has been retreated up, but now it is slightly trending down. But you can see the gulf between India and China in terms of growth rate. So India is beginning to catch up, right? And if you see in the next few years, I say advantage India, because already if you see in global iron and steel, India has gained some share of global iron and steel trade from China. In export market apparel, in along with Southeast Asia, Mexico, India has also benefited from China's loss. And if you see our market share of services has seen a sharp growth. We're still not caught up with China, but we have seen a sharp growth in our service exports faster than China's growth. So if you then see that total factor productivity, there's land, labor, and capital as factors, right? In factor productivity, India is set to outpace China over the next years to come. So this is basically a productivity index. So as a result of which, we think that in real GDP growth, India will be able to sustain a much higher terminal rate of growth and a longer growth phase as compared to that of China. From that point of view, right, what we are saying is the same thing that I said earlier, that what China achieved in four years, we hope to achieve in nine years. And hence, the road to global dominance is driven by these three factors. Demographics, productivity, and the transition to a multipolar, non-China dependent world. So in that point of view, already as per IMF statistics for 2023, we expect to be the fastest growing nation in the world. If you take UBS, they have projected it down to 2024 to say that India will grow at 6.8 for 2024. And if you then look at the fact of the business cycle that we are in, India has just come out of the COVID bottom and we are here. So we still have a long way to go in terms of from the early cycle to expansion, expansion to a late cycle before we see the next business cycle turn down. And hence, over the five-year period, if you see, this is each bucket, 2001 to 8, 8 to 13, India is going to add about $2 trillion in GDP over the next five years. And we are going to add much more than Japan and UK. And hence, right, if you see by 2028, India from its 14th rank in 2006 is already today in the 5th rank and will have a reasonable chance of overtaking Germany and Japan and becoming the third largest country in the world. But more importantly, by the end of the decade, 20% of global growth is going to come from India. So as a result of which, if you then look at it, I think that by 2036, India retaining its third position will hopefully be a part of a tripolar world and not just a US-China bipolar world. And that Trimurti of India, China and USA will dominate the world. 
I just want to end with just two slides. I'm not going to spend time on the markets today. But what this implies for the markets, right, is that over the long term, all of us know it, the market cap tracks or even does better than the nominal GDP. So the same three examples of India, South Korea, and China I have presented here. As you can see, from 15 years CAGR, China's nominal GDP grew at 8.4 and market cap grew at 9.7. Sorry, 13, 13 and 18 and a half, that was India there, and South Korea 3.6. So naturally from a stock market perspective, over a 15 year time frame, we can expect that our nominal GDP growth rate, which are expected between 12 to 15 percent, should be exceeded by the stock market. Yes, and the other aspect is that this 2003 to 8 phase, which was a previous growth, if you track in timelines, that is number of weeks into the bull market, this run so far seems to be very reasonably close to what we saw in 2003 to 8. Why I point this out is, it was that period that the Chinese stock market also boomed. Can you see there? So this 2003 to 8 phase getting replicated, right, means very good news from the thing. Yes, the global recession is there to throw cold water on our uh, aspirations. But as we all want to say, every correction has led to phenomenal gains. So this gives you the reds are the correction periods, 50%, 60%, 40%, and 17% corrections. But the subsequent bull runs are not only very enriching, but also very long lasting. So every correction should be treated as a buying opportunity with the long-term story of India, right? And hence, I'd like to end to say, believe in India, global dominance is our birthright. <laughs>